appreciate y'all being here. Uh, thanks for joining us at Secular AZ today. Again, put your name in the chat or on the webinar or on Facebook. We are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade. And of course, we have great programming. Our Friday updates uh, include all kinds of speakers, historians, authors, elected officials, journalists. Next Friday, we are going to be speaking with Maya Zuckerberg, gun violence prevention, uh, prevention and school safety advocate, president of Arizonans for Gun Safety, and former political co-director of March for Our Lives. She's going to be joining us next week, so that will be uh, one you won't want to miss. Um, also, if you're interested in getting more involved with our organization, we are looking for volunteers to help with our school board support initiative. And we are in the middle of a membership drive for 2023 as our membership rates are going up nominally in 2024. So if you do become a member or renew your membership now, we've got some really cool gifts for you. We've got magnetic bumper stickers, uh, tote bags, travel mugs. We wanted to have things that said, you know, I am unapologetically secular. Um, we wanted things that would hopefully spark conversations. And I really enjoy when um, somebody from one of our more rural communities is willing to get, say, a tote bag or a magnetic bumper sticker, because that means that they're willing to invite those conversations with their neighbors who they may disagree with. So be sure to check out our website. And of course, Lindsay has all those links up, but I am not going to talk at you anymore. I am back in the Midwest with my father and the internet is very spotty. And so I want to get right down to brass tacks. But today we are joined with two um, just champions, really, two folks uh, who are, um, you know, with this organization to be able to block bad legislation. We were talking a little bit before we started today about how they've been so successful at blocking bad legislation that I think that all of us nonprofit advocacy groups could really learn something. So today we're being joined by, and I hope I say this right, Christy, is it Chait? Chait, Barry, that's right. Okay. Christy Chait and Ann Thompson. Uh, they're with Moms Demand Action, um, started it off as volunteers and now work at blocking legislation. And I'm sure you actually probably actually have some model legislation from other states that perhaps you've had drafted that you keep trying to get through to our legislature. So I am going to turn it over to you. I'm going to turn my camera off and, um, you know, go ahead, tag team it uh, and, and tell us all about the kind of work, the very important work that you do. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jeannie. And if it's okay with you, I'll get started. Um, my name is Christy Chait, and I am the co-lead of Phoenix Moms Demand Action. Um, I have been a member of Moms Demand Action since 2016 um, and, and took over the co-lead of the Phoenix chapter, which I'm told is uh, one of the biggest chapters uh, in the country uh, doing, doing this work. And so let me just tell you a little bit about me, and you'll understand where my passion comes from. I'm I'm an attorney, a partner at a, a firm downtown. Um, I have three children, ages 12 to 24. Uh, my son was in first grade when Sandy Hook happened and Moms Demand Action is an outgrowth of the Sandy Hook shooting. Um, Shannon Watts, who started and is the founder of Moms Demand Action and an absolutely brilliant, amazing, articulate, inspirational woman for those of you who don't know about her, uh, look her up and follow her. Uh, but she started this when she felt absolutely frustrated by the ongoing school shootings. And for me and my family, it, it started before Sandy Hook. Um, in 2004, my 33-year-old brother-in-law was shot and killed at work um, by a friend that he grew up with who was going through some drug issues had had a restraining order by his family placed on him, uh, but he still had firearms. And so he was mad at his family and he was mad at some of his high school friends. So he went to my brother-in-law's workplace and shot he and uh, his other best friend. And that was um, so many years ago that his 18 month old son who was left behind at the time is graduating proudly for us for, as a family from college uh, in June. And I tell you that to, to say, as so many people, and I think the statistics now are one in every three people has uh, someone that they're touched, they're touched by gun violence is 
that although that happened in 2004, the ramifications uh, are for our family for a lifetime in, in one instance. Um, at that time, we thought, how is it that somebody who's mentally unstable can get a, a firearm? And, and here we are to this day, you know, almost 20 years later, hearing about instances in schools and workplaces all over the country where people who should not have firearms um, have firearms. So um, I, I got involved in 2016 um, and have been actively involved since um, and then decided to take on the, the Phoenix chapter. So let me tell you a little bit about our, our great chapter now that I've talked about why, why I care so deeply about this issue. Um, again, it, I'm sharing my screen. Hopefully you all can see it. This is our chapter at one of our, our very big um, events, uh, Wear Orange, which occurs in June of every year where um, people come together to commemorate gun violence survivors and victims and talk about the importance of gun violence prevention and gun safety. So we usually have a pretty big event. We are joined by the Phoenix Mercury for the last two years uh, in that effort, and they are a great partner in the community, um, mostly because they also are moms. Uh, the entire coaching staff at this game last year wore Moms Demand Action shirts, and it was really inspirational. Um, so th that is one of the several big events that we do every um, year. But in addition, we do the grinding work of gun violence prevention and education. And so um, Moms Demand Action, again, it's a local um, group, but part of a national movement. So started Moms Demand Action started as a grassroots organization, merging then um, several years ago with Every Town and Students Demand Action. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with all of these groups, but Students Demand Action and March for Our Lives, very active since the Parkland shooting. Um, so we work together and we work locally. Um, I am the co-lead of the Phoenix group, but there is now, I'm proud to say, a West Valley group and an East Valley group and a Fountain Hills group that started after uh, a, a recent shooting. Um, Tucson group, Flagstaff group. So we have a number of groups in the state of Arizona. And I saw that our state lead is on this call, RJ, and she manages all of the various local groups so we can work together, but also work within our community as different community needs. Um, we are mothers, fathers, grandparents, students, any, anybody can join. Uh, the name is because it was started by a couple of moms, uh, but anyone can join and we welcome everyone in um, the fold, certainly. We talk at, we, we typically meet monthly. Um, sometimes uh, we have an event instead of a monthly meeting, but we talk a lot about these statistics that as terrifying as they are, um, we need to be well-versed in them so that when we're talking to people and trying ultimately to get a consensus on what we can do to improve, we need to try to convince our um, you know, fellow citizens, uh, fellow, uh, other uh, go gun owners, people who are concerned about violation of the constitutional rights. So th these kind of statistics and education we do at every one of our meetings, as well as constant communication within our group. Um, throughout the month. So I, I, I hate to say that I'm sure these are numbers that you've seen, but you've probably seen an increase in a lot of discussion about gun violence statistics because with President Biden and the Build Back Better uh, legislation that was passed, there has been a new attention or attention for the first time in 20 years to gun violence um, funding programs, funding local uh, groups and violence prevention programs. So that is certainly much needed, but, but good news to be able to talk about openly and with importantly research and data that we can use. Um, Christy, um, uh, Christy and, and would it be possible, somebody asked, Lee asked if you might be able to make it um, a full screen 
if you could do the slideshow presentation. I know sometimes um, I know sometimes it doesn't always work. I think it's that button right there uh, to the up to the top where it says slideshow. If you click that, I think that will make it larger. So where it says to see the share button and then the slideshow button next to it. If not, I know it happens sometimes if it's like Apple and Zoom. I use I don't um, use Apple products because I I, I, I I maybe I'm missing. Where do you see slideshow? So I may if you look where it says all the way to the right, there's the little symbol of a person. And then just to the left of that, there's share. Go further down. And then mm -hmm. just to the left of that. Uh, no, not there. Don't I wouldn't click those buttons where it says under keep going down with your pointer. And then there's a button that says slideshow. Like there's a little picture of a camera there. See if you maybe. move your cursor. See yeah, right there. Slideshow. I, okay. So if not, that's fine. Um, but just somebody requested it. Yeah. And I know that with Lindsay, uh, the the Mac freezes when they do slideshows. So if you've got a Mac, there's a, yeah, see, there's a really good chance it won't work. So unfortunately, Lee, I apologize. We might not okay. be able to do it like that. Um, but Farrell does ask, and I'm sorry, I forgot to ask you in the beginning um, if, if it's okay to ask questions, but Farrell is asking where your stats come from. Where our stats come from? So let me, um, our, our statistics come from national data. Um, I think you can see, for example, I don't know if you can see on, on this particular screen, it says uh, where orange um, dot com and or dot org. Obviously, that is a gun violence prevention site, but all of these are data um, by national organizations, um, state organizations. All of this is is pretty consistent data. But if there's a specific source you want me to send you, I'm happy to. Or if you go on momsdemandaction.org, there's a whole section of data where it's coming from, if it's from the NIH or any other organization. So hopefully that answers the question um, on, on the data sources. Um, uh, continuing on with what we do as a group, um, we do some community work. So for example, I, I hopefully you can see it, but we volunteer at um, St. Mary's Food Bank at least once or twice a year as a group. It's a great opportunity to work and also kind of talk about what would you like to see our group do? What can we um, do more of? What do people want to hear about? Um, the, the top right, if you can see it, is the um, ban assault rifle um, walkout that we had. It was Mother's Day weekend this year where we had a number of people come out and put up signs uh, at busy intersections to ban assault rifles. Um, importantly, one of the things that our group does is something called Be Smart. And for those of you who are on um, school boards, you may be familiar with this, uh, but this is what we like to say. Again, we, we'd like to say gun violence prevention is um, nonpartisan. But certainly be smart, which is storing guns, firearms safely in your home um, is a program that we are very proud of. Uh, we have been doing it for a number of years. Our group has two leads that go either to presentations at school boards, school districts, um, conferences, events, anywhere you need us if we can be there to talk about the very simple issue of storing your guns safely. There has been um, a number of stories, I'm sure many of you have read them in the press of you know, young children just finding a gun under a bed, under a mattress, in a closet, and shooting their sibling or their young friend who's over for a play date. Um, last month within our group, we had a very brave family from Phoenix who came to talk to us about Christian's law. Um, and that was their teenage son had gone over to play at a friend's house and have a sleepover. Uh, I believe it was within the last year or two. And uh, the friend wanted to show him the gun that his parents had and inadvertently shot and killed their son who was at a sleepover. So they have been lobbying for something called Christian's Law, which um, in part would require that there be a penalty if a family has not um, safely stored their firearm and something like that happens. 
And sadly, we're talking about a civil penalty of $1,000 and we could not get a hearing on that. Uh, but Anne will speak more to you all about the types of legislation that we work on um, with the current structure of our House and Senate. Basically, it is playing defense on bad bills and she'll talk a little bit about that. But thankfully having uh, Katie Hobbs in the governor's mansion is a, is a big plus for being able to have those bills vetoed. So um, advocacy, having a particular day where we go down to the legislature, typically at the beginning of the year. So we are looking at doing that the first part of February, 2024. Um, we talk about with, with our representatives, the importance to us as, as one of their constituents, a voter of passing gun safety bills, of, of blocking bad uh, gun laws. And you know they need to hear from us that this is an important issue. And so that is something that we talk about frequently in our meetings and how can we be involved in that both in advocacy and in election work that we are also quite involved in. So um, let me just close again so, how we work. We've got a state chapter here in Arizona along with a number of um, local organizations. So if you're interested in joining and you live in a particular part of the Valley, you can certainly reach out to one of us and we can let you know what would be the closest chapter to you. But I know every chapter needs everybody who's willing to give one minute or one hour or whatever it may be because it really takes all of us. Um, here is a, I don't know, can you see that Jeannie? That's a QR code for, if you put your phone up to this QR code, it will take you to our Moms Demand Action page, which will tell you everything we've got coming up, how you can help, um, what we've done in the past, what we've got looking forward. So we've got it all really well organized in that one spot. So hopefully you all are able to see that and scan that. And then in closing, this is what we have coming up. So my chapter, Phoenix chapter, we typically meet in Central Phoenix at Changing Hands Bookstore. Um, it's typically the third Wednesday of every month. It is hybrid. So we have people in there, there in person, typically 25 to 30, and another 25 to 30 on Zoom, where again, we talk about all of the issues we can cover in an hour and a half. Uh, or so this month, we are gonna be talking about do domestic violence prevention month and awareness. Uh, certainly guns and easy access to, to weapons is inter, you know, interwoven too much to domestic violence incidents. And so we will be focusing on that this month um, in our meeting. And um, so with that, I, I will turn it over to Anne unless there's any questions or I can answer some questions at the end, certainly. So there's, there is one question here in the chat. Um, and I think it's because it looked like you, you know, there's a photo with you with uh, St. Mary's food bank. Um, uh, but the question is, are you, hold on just a second. Are you advocating religion? You mentioned that you help out at um, St. Mary's food bank. I mean, I'm sure it's probably just a, uh, you go ahead and explain it, but sure. we partner with religious organizations sometimes too. So, yes, I, I I think it's it's just a matter of um, caring about food insecurity, especially during COVID. Finding something for our group to do together during COVID, we sort of got involved. But it, there's no religious aspect to our group. We have every type of religion or non-religion. And I can tell you, Anne can speak to this. All you have to do is go down to the legislature and, and hear those strident legislators talk about guns and their God-given right to own them, to know that there is no God-given right in this one way or the other. So absolutely not. That's kind of what I figured. And as Mars points out in the chat, Mars says that St. Mary's isn't religious if you can just get past the name. They do a lot of good work in our community. And of course, it's a it's a good partnership to get in front of those folks, too. So I will go ahead. There's a few other comments here, you know, folks talking about how they've been affected by gun violence throughout their lives, even as long as, you know, decades ago. 
uh, back in the 80s, some some Janice says that a friend was shot and survived at his friend's house in the 80s, showing off his dad's gun. So it's definitely not a new thing. However, I feel like, I, I mean, and you could probably speak more about this, but I feel like per capita now, compared to the 80s, there's probably a lot more guns in the United States now in the 2020s than there were in the 1980s. Yeah, and just two quick points, and I'll let it go to Anne, but um, two quick points on this. That if, when you look at the numbers of gun, uh, first-time gun owners during COVID, um, you know, just a shocking increase of the number of guns, people feeling unsafe, uh, you know, I, I guess understandably, but that is that is a significant factor that will affect us for years and decades to come, which is why we're so passionate about how can we make it safer? We know this is out here. We know we're not going to take over 300 million guns away from anyone, nor can that be the goal. But how can we make this safer for our children, for places where you can have and use weapons um, or guns? And so definitely that's one factor. And two is the AR-15. I, I mean, if you look back at the history of the AR-15, you will see that that was something that just was not uh, of interest to any gun owners until just in the last 10 or 15 years where the marketing campaign for the AR-15 is just off the charts. And so now you feel and you see people holding on to that particular weapon. It is their identity uh, and it is like unbelievable um, uh, I don't know, worship of that gun. But to me, those are two really at least recent developments that have contributed to the increase of weapons everywhere. Uh, and thus, you know, there's going to be an increase in incidents and events going on. So with that, I will turn it over to Anne and happy to answer any other questions as well. Okay, well, I will start. Um, my name is Anne Thompson and I am a a volunteer. I'm retired. I used to be a, a book editor and before that a librarian. And um, currently the legislative lead for the Phoenix chapter of Moms Demand Action. I got involved with moms when Sandy Hook happened and I thought this is horrible. You know, we have to do something about guns. And uh, like so many people, like Shannon Watts, who started this group. And um, I also have my two daughters are, are grown now, but I have a six-year-old grandson who is in first grade. And as, as Christy mentioned, you know, you, you just, anybody who has children in school, or grandchildren, or just <laughs> cares about children, is so worried about school shootings. Um, I also want to advance, apologize because my voice does tend to get hoarse. So I hope it doesn't go out on me. I have a throat condition. Um, okay. One of the one of the most important things that we do is, is advocate for uh, both for and against proposed legislation, both in federal laws and in state laws. Um, and to talk more about children, as you may know, guns are now the number one killer of children ahead of car accidents. And this is um, from CDC uh, statistics. Um, they're figures from 2021, which is the latest date we have. Um, there were 4,752 deaths of children ages 17 and under. In Arizona, we had 89 children ages 70, 17 and under during that year who died from gunshot gunshots. Um, some of these numbers are, well, a significant number of these children are our teenagers who who shoot the guns who kill themselves and that's it's of great concern to us uh 
I'm going to start with a brief rundown of federal laws and issues. And the you may know that the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which passed in 2022, quote, aims to keep guns out of the hands of individuals under 21 who are prohibited from purchasing fire ground, firearms or should be prohibited. For instance, the teenager who, who shot everybody at the Parkland High School, um, empowering the Justice Department with new authorities to prosecute firearms traffickers, importing access to mental health services in schools to help young people deal with the trauma and grief resulting from gun violence, gun violence, which I think shouldn't be necessary, and investing in community violence interventions. Um, and as a result, there are now grants available in the state for trauma-informed care for adults and children. Um, there's the nationwide 988 suicide hotline for better fair care for people in cross crisis and other types of counseling. Um, but there are still three very essential federal laws which would make our lives much safer. And we still don't have these. First is that we don't have federal laws regarding requiring background checks on all gun purchases because the only people who, who will register gun purchases are registered gun dealers. So registered gun stores will do this. But if you buy a gun from your friend or uh, your neighbor or some guy online, uh, you don't have to register your gun. And of course, stolen guns are not registered. Um, that's quite a large loophole and it's probably never going to be completed, but it, it really should be uh, worked on. It should be a law. And the NRA likes to say that the National Rifle Association says that despite Illinois having very strong gun laws, which they do, state laws, including background checks that still they have all that gun violence in Chicago uh, and therefore strong gun laws don't work. That's not true. The enormous, there are a number of reasons for that, um, primarily that neighboring states such as Indiana do not have background checks and they don't have a ban on assault weapons. So it's easy to bring uh, guns across state lines and there will always be uh, illegal trafficking of guns. The second federal law we need to pass is a ban on assault weapons. As Christy said, it's got they've gotten tremendously popular in the last 10, 15 years. There used to be a ban on assault rifles, but the only way it could pass and this was in the 90s, I think, um, was if it had a, it only had a specified number of years that it could operate and then it didn't get renewed. So we don't have one anymore. Um, but that would, there is a current bill in the Senate that would ban all semi-automatic rifles, semi-automatic pistols, semi-automatic shotguns and any kind of ammunition magazine that would allow continued rapid shooting. Um, 10 states, including California, Illinois, New York, Massachusetts, and others have passed this ban, but uh, the country does not have any kind of ban. Uh, the third important law needed is to ch uh, change the Charleston, Charleston loophole, which is, Currently, if you buy a gun from a registered dealer and the background check takes longer than three days, you're, you're free to buy the gun. And that's what happened with the young man in Charleston, South Carolina, who murdered the nine uh, black worshipers in the Ch Charleston church. 
Uh, he should not have been allowed to have a gun based on his police record. And I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the date of that. It was some years ago. Um, if these things are important to you, please get in, please contact Senator Cinema and Kelly that you want some movement on this, this bill and that it needs to come up for a vote and and the, uh, well, the, I'm sorry, the, the assault weapons bill is, is, is currently in the Senate, which is S25. And that one would, uh, that one you should contact your senators and your representatives um, to let them know that you don't like this, the assault bans being available, you don't like the background, checks loophole and you don't like the Charleston loophole. Um, before I talk about state legislative matters, I'd like to talk a little bit about how cozy Republican legislators, both federal and state are with gun lobbyists. The NRA is the most prominent and powerful, but there are many other groups who advocate for gun friendly laws, notably the firearm manufacturers. Um, and then there are local Second Amendment groups, which are, uh, for example, the Arizona Civil Defense League, and they always have their lobbyists come and testify whenever there is a bill in favor of gun rights. And there's a new group of women, uh, Women for Gun Rights, which has chapters in every state. And they've been showing up to testify too. Um, the NRA lobbyists actually write the legislation or help to write the legislation for Republican legislators. Um, and I've even seen a Republican state senator get all tangled up in his description of what the bill would propose and then ask the NRA lobbyists to come and explain it. So it, this is a real thing that happens. And the NRA has become steadily more right-wing and shrill, has as long ago as 1995, uh, spoken favorably of militias. And um, on the same, at the same time, it was denying publicly that they had any connection, connection with militias. The, they've also tried to tell all gun owners that go, the government will take your guns away. And that's another reason you need to have guns. <laughs> and, um, they believe that NRA and many fine firearms owners believe it is their sacred duty to preserve the rights that they have under the Second Amendment, and they need to exercise those rights. There is a strong connection between right-wing Christians and the support of owning guns. Uh, the Second Amendment enthusiasts were also helped mightily by the Supreme Court in 2008 when they stated that the public had a right to self-defense based on the Second Amendment. Pro-gun pro rights people believe that it is, the, again, their sacred duty to keep themselves and their families safe by owning guns. And it's, it's um, it just, it, it has caused the number of guns in American life to skyrocket. You've probably heard the, the statistic that there are now more guns so that there's so many guns in the United States that every citizen could own more than two guns. Um, they've, convinced, they've convinced almost all Republicans in office that in order to get elected, they need to be strong Second Amendment supporters. And of course, with the advent of, of Donald Trump, it's become even more important for Republicans to embrace the Second Amendment. Okay, now 
I will talk about the state legislation. Uh, currently, the state legislature is not in session. They had the longest session in history this past year, and they didn't uh, adjourn, I think, until July. They usually adjourn in, in uh, maybe it was August, in by April, May. But this year it went and went on and on and on. A lot of it was about the budget. Um, I'll start with a few statistics about Arizona's gun laws. Um, Arizona is currently, and this is these statistics come from the research department of every town, and they are our umbrella organization that we operate under, and they have quite a large research department. They've ranked Arizona number 42 out of the 50 states in terms of having uh, strong gun laws. They, they, the uh, every town lists 50 key policies and laws that states should have in order to make their, their residents more safe. Uh, out of those 50, we only have seven. And I'm proud to say that two of them, as has been mentioned, um, we have fought against over and over again. And that is uh, not allowing or forcing colleges and universities to uh, allow concealed carry of firearms and not allowing guns in K-12 schools by staff or parents or anybody else on campus. Um, other things are we, Arizona does bar gun possession by people with felony conviction, convictions, which is very sensible. Uh, it bars gun possession by people who have been involuntarily committed or found to be a danger or others. It bars gun possession by convicted stalkers. Now, this is interesting. We, Arizona does require law enforcement agencies to collect and report data on the use of, of police force incidents. So that was something that I was a little surprised to say, to see. Um, I don't like to castigate all Republicans, but I'm just about ready to. And my late mother was a Republican and she would not recognize the, the current party. But every year since in the last four years or such, or such in which I've been on the legislative team, state led Republicans have introduced the same or similar dangerous firearm bills. And they also oppose any gun safety bills. We have had a number of gun safety bills that were proposed primarily by Jen Longden, who is a state representative and who herself was shot in an accidental drive-by shoot, I mean, a drive-by shooting where they shot her uh, when they were really looking to shoot someone else. And she's now paralyzed from the waist down. But every year she, she and other Democrats do write, legisla <clears throat> write legislation to make our straight state more safe. Um, but since the Republicans hold a majority in the state legislature, they get to choose which guns go, which, which, which legislation goes on to be discussed, especially in committees uh, at the state legislature. And that once you've gone through a committee, if you've survived that, you go through the rest of the legislation process and, and you become, and it becomes a bill that the whole legislation votes on. But we didn't get any of our good bills uh, advanced by Republican leaders this past year. And some of them were, as Christy mentioned, Christian's Law, 
and two other bills that would either give misdemeanor penalties to parents who have negligently left guns where children could get them, or um, one, one bill that never saw the light of day was to give uh, felony felonies to the adults who were responsible based on whether a child was injured or, or killed. Um, Can I ask a quick, quick question about that, yes. Anne? I'm yes. sorry. And I know there's a bit of a lag, but like, I think about, and I don't, unfortunately, I feel like I can't even keep straight the mass shootings anymore. Like right. Americans now are at this point where we, I can't remember, did it happen in um, Florida? Did it happen in Connecticut? It, it's impossible, but there was there was a school shooter I recall and and there was a lot of red flags for that particular child. And I believe now there's a discussion about whether the parents should have responsibility. So is that some of the legislation that uh, you all are trying to enact to make sure that those folks who, you know, when, when when somebody who's under the age of 18 accesses weapons through their parents or whatever, their parents give them the stamp of approval to be able to purchase those weapons. Is that one of the strategies that you're currently using? Yeah, and that's part of giving fennel, uh, penalties such as felonies to the adults who know about guns or who that the child has and that the child is in endangering others is it in, in danger of endangering others um we've also tried to just put in as our be smart program does we've tried to uh, put legislation together that would require healthcare providers and pediatrics to simply hand out a half pamphlet that would instruct parents about the danger of having guns in their houses and of going to other people's houses who might have guns. Uh, that did not see the light of day. Uh, yes, the, I'm sorry, Jeannie, the, uh, the red, the bill that prevents, there was a bill that prevents individuals in crisis subject to severe threat protection to keep them from having access to guns, was, which is a red flag law. Um, that is something that where you could quickly stop the individual from having their, their gun. Um, we also- you know, Okay, I, I, quick question too, because again, being uh, you know, being a member of a board where we did pass the Be Smart resolution, where it meant that every single one of our families, right, had uh, included with their basic information, right, like their basic, um, you know, here's if you if you uh, you know if your kid's going to be able to access the library, or if they're going to you know if they need to get on the bus, all those forms, if they can mm -hmm. get aspirin from the nurse, those kinds of things. Right. We included the Be Smart uh, protocol with everything that our students got and our families got every single year. I would love to hear the 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 thinking of the opposition, because this seems like a no brainer to me. Yeah. What is it that the opposition dislikes about the Be Smart um, policy that you freely give? to school districts so they can reduce the number of potential, you know, gun shootings. Right. Well, I think it's my belief that it's because it's inconvenient for gun owners. Um, they want to keep their guns. I know I've heard some people say they, they don't feel safe unless they have the gun uh, in the drawer next to them on the, by the bed um, or the gun under the bed. And uh, they feel that if they have to lock their gun and they have to lock their ammunition, that they're not going to be able to quickly uh, access that. And of course, that is a, a consideration, but you know, it's 
I'm also a firm believer that if I owned a gun and tried to use it against somebody, they would simply take it away from me and shoot me. So it it's there's just so many reasons why you should not have guns just easy easily accessed at homes. And and I think and I think they also believe that there's just a slippery slope to um losing their Second Amendment rights if they have their guns locked up. So that's what I think. Um, now, I do want to try to share my screen and show you some of the bad guns that did pass the legislature, which we, we fought against. And let's see. Um, And while you're doing that, I just want to say, um, I, I just want to give a voice to some of these comments here uh, that school shootings, RJ uh, Shannon points out that please understand that school shootings comprise 2% of gun related incidents, while the highest number of shootings in Arizona are suicide, mm -hmm. uh, which is another reason why, especially, um, it makes so much sense if you're in a family, uh, you know, if you have family members that you should want to hide them. Um, John says they don't want parents thinking about their guns being a danger to their kids because those parents might rethink future gun purchases. Yes, the gun lobby is very strong and it's all about the bottom line. I mean, this is capitalism. Diane says these people are watching too much TV. Right. Like there is this narrative. My, I'm home with my father now in, in, in a rural community in Illinois. And he watches local news, which I never do. And holy moly, is the entire um, <laughs> the entire newscast is about like how you shouldn't trust your neighbor and you should be afraid of everything. So right. that's a great point, too. And then Bonnie points out, I am not happy about Tom Horn's intention to hire off duty cops in uniform. Um, uh, in uniform to be an armed presence in Arizona schools, paying them $100 an hour. Uh, we can get to that later. Does anyone else have concerns? Bonnie, yes, I certainly do. But I want to get back to Ann so she can get back to her uh, bills. Okay, well, we worked very hard to contact and ask Governor Hobbs to veto these bad gun bills here listed that were passed by the legislature the Republican legislature. And to our great happiness, they she vetoed all of them. Um, the two that I'd like to, the two asterisk ones are the ones that we worked very hard on. And that was, we've already mentioned this, but parents, allowing parents and guardians with concealed carry permits to bring their firearms to schools. We are with all of the concern about school shootings, why add more guns to schools? And it's easy to, I could easily see a parent bringing a gun in a purse or in a pocket, uh, a jacket pocket, a pants pocket, and having a, a, a kid notice that and grab it, um, or simply the person dropping it and the gun goes off. Um, sometimes the the one very annoying and stupid reason that I thought that one woman testified why this was an important bill was because it basically was too inconvenient for her to, if she had to go, oh, she sketched out a scenario, and scenario where suppose her child broke her arm at school and the school nurse called and said, your, your, your child has broken her arm. Can you come and, and uh, be with her? And the parent says, doesn't can't stop to think, oh, I have to leave my gun at home or I have to lock it up in my car. They're so anxious to get to the school. Um, and that they could be arrested at the school if it were noticed that she had a, a firearm. So it was basically for the convenience of people who feel that they must have 
guns on their person every day, everywhere. And they also try to make the lame excuse that, uh, that they could be a good guy with, with a gun who, could, if there were a school shooting, they could help stop the school shooter, um, which has been proven many times not to be true because it makes more work if, if the law enforcement is there trying to stop the school shooter. They don't know if a, a parent who starts shooting, they don't know if that person is a shooter. Um, it's also shown that, parent, that even people with concealed carry permits, which are extremely easy to get in, uh, in Arizona, um, they don't know how to shoot and they, they're just wildly shooting around. Um, they could injure or kill other people in the area. So it's just not necessary and it's not safe. And the same situation for uh, concealed carry of firearms at public universities and colleges, including uh, public community colleges, should be allowed. And that, you know, if if guns are on college campuses and can be, uh, think of of college kids. They're often, um, their brains aren't fully formed as, as has been shown. They can be depressed or upset about um, romance has gone wrong or grades and um, look at the, the poor professor at the U of A who was shot and killed last year by a student who was upset about his grades. Um, the, the, the chief of police of ASU testified against this bill saying it would make his job and his police officers' jobs more dangerous and harder if this law were passed. But the Republicans completely ignored this and um, voted for this bill to pass. So, uh, those and were I mean, for those for those folks who don't go to the these committee hearings like you, Christy, and I do, and you it's so funny because you go there, especially when you first start going there. You know, when I was a when I was a teacher thinking, oh, well, you know what? All I have to do is share my personal story yeah. with these legislators about how underfunded my schools are and how overcrowded my classrooms are. Certainly they're going to listen to that because I, you know, I'm a constituent. No, they do not. And people can come with whatever areas of expertise, right? I was especially offended when the, you know, campus uh, police and, and security people, and even I think it was Tempe police, the, the whoever, like they were, they were like, this is a terrible idea to allow anybody to come onto a college. And here, let me let me tell you the, the 50 reasons why it's a terrible idea. Yeah. And they'll go through the motions and listen to these folks and then completely deny their experience in most cases. So if you are somebody who isn't accustomed to going to the legislature, um, you need to fortify yourself at least with some good friends or uh, maybe, you know, like a, an opportunity to, to debrief afterwards, because what you're going to find is that common sense, you know, we're talking about common sense gun law, but common sense doesn't really prevail at our capital, unfortunately, mm -hmm. even despite the fact that we have a 1% majority from one side to the other. That's right. That's right. So um, I see we're running out of time. So I'll just uh, leave this here. And you can see what all the things that we had to fight against and that Katie Hobbs vetoed. Uh, but I will stop sharing. No, I'll just keep it up. Um, I just want to finish with saying that we advocate against bills 
by we ha do have uh, an every town legislative team uh, who does research the legislation that's coming up and who fills us in on some of the basic points, or tells us the bill numbers and we can look them up on the Arizona State Legislature website, which is very helpful. Um, and you also probably, most of you know about requests to speak, which is a, a opportunity that's on the Arizona State Legislature website where you can register your opposition or your uh, in favor of particular bills. And you can also add comments to your support or opposition. Uh, you do, even though it says request to speak, you do not have to speak at committee meetings. But if you want to, you then check a box that's on RTS that you want to speak. Um, we also contact our legislature, legislators constantly. We call, visit, email legislators to talk to them about our concerns about, well, more recently, the bad gun bills and the reasons not to support them. Um, we've developed warm and appreciative relationships with some legislators, all Democrats. Um, but I have to say, we did have a thought, one thoughtful conversation with a Republican about three years ago, who's no longer in office, who thought it was a terrible idea to have concealed carry on uh, college campuses. His daughter was going to ASU. He said, I was in the military and we had extensive training on how safe use of firearms and how to use them. And the average person with who has a concealed carry permit or doesn't have any permit at all, um, doesn't know how to use a firearm. So that's... Uh, I do think, that you know, one thing that we've been doing, Christy and Anne, is we've been trying to provide support for school board members because like you and Mom's Demand, we have kind of, you know, I joke about it all the time. Um, the only thing that keeps Arizona from being Texas or Florida is Katie Hobbs. Mm -hmm. And I think my lucky stars every single day that we have the veto stamp of, of Katie Hobbs, who has already said publicly, like, I'm not going, I'm going to support things that are actually going to support the people of Arizona. I'm not going to sign anything that's discriminatory. And I'm going to veto things that just don't make sense. So where we have put our weight behind, um, and it's, it, you know, it's it's a great fit for us at Secular AZ because we are nonpartisan, but we are focused on issues. And this issue of, you know, first of all, just pro-public education, making sure that our kids aren't being indoctrinated and that our tax dollars aren't going to private schools that can indoctrinate children is to also like pay attention to what is going on with your local school board members. And for many of those, like, I didn't know, it wasn't until I, uh, in 2020, when I ran for Maricopa County School Superintendent, of course, I got in front of a, a bunch of y'all, the Moms Demand folks, uh, and, and you said, hey, what about this, um, you know, be smart policy for your school district? And 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 I I wouldn't have known about it, you know what I mean? And I think that y'all have expanded in the last three or four years, and so I think it's a really great way because one of the things we talk about on on our Friday discussions is like how can we have hope? How can we promote the kind of ideologies that we care about? And this is a great way to go learn more about the Be Smart um, campaign for school board members. All it requires, I mean, most of our school boards in Arizona have five members. Many of our school boards, even those that are maybe a little bit, um, you know, divided, the the majority of that board, right? If you've got a three-two board, now is the time to pass that resolution for your board. And so, go ahead and look. I would I would encourage all of you to take a look, whether you're in Scottsdale Unified, if you're in Casa Grande, if you're in Catalina Foothills, if you're in Peoria, take a look and see if your board has adopted the Be Smart 
resolution to make sure that students at least every single student in that district will then have you know some some way to 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 try to make them safer it's a very simple thing that you can do you can email your board right now you can and perhaps if you know somebody who just got elected to their board in 2022 you can give them a call and say hey does your board have this resolution and if not can we get it in front of them yeah absolutely one one of our um members very heroically uh got the entire uh, Phoenix Union School High School District to adopt Be Smart, and it was printed in the school handbook um, or the online version, and the parents had to sign or initial that, and so that was a great, uh, great thing to do. And if you and need any... Just... I'm sorry, if you need Go any ahead. of the information, Jeannie, just make sure somebody reaches out to us. Um, we're happy to get you a presentation, the materials, anything. We have an entire team uh, for that, and that's what they do. And one thing I really appreciate that you all said is that this is a nonpartisan issue. You yeah. know, this this uh, there's there's no right or left here. Um, when we know that guns are the number one killer of our children in the United States. This is no longer a partisan issue. And if anybody makes it a partisan issue and tries to reject the safety of our children, then they need to be, they need to have a microscope on them because I am concerned if these folks are rejecting something as simple as locking up your guns, then we have to take a deeper look at them. And so I know, I know it's 104 and I, well, wait, hold on. It's, whatever time it is, <laughs> because I'm on a time difference. <laughs> it's 204. Thank you very much. Um, but I do, I mean, the, the the way that your organization has just come onto the scene and enlisted all of these passionate people who care so much, not only about our children, but just about like our society, Christy and Anne, I appreciate you beyond measure. And this is the question that I ask every Friday, like what gives you hope? Because sometimes it's hard to find hope. So what gives you hope? I think meeting, being with like people who are also uh, very, very passionate about this, um, talking to, um, I was at a, I participated in a Be Smart demonstration in, um, on, the, on the West Side, and I talked to some grandparents who said, oh, yes, we own guns, and I said, do you have them in a safe, and they said, no, we don't really need to, because we have them up on a very high um, shelf, and I said, it's been proven that children know where guns are and they can somehow ladders whatever get um get up there and um they said oh <laughs> and, and then the they said they do have grandchildren who visit all the time and the grandmother said to the grandfather we better lock our guns so that was great um, I have to say that what gives me hope is young people. I mean, when you and you guys will be hearing from Maya um, next week, we've had her speak as well. And the clarity with which they see this issue, because for all of us who are older, it's kind of come into our life in this kind of slow motion um, or fast motion. But in any mm -hmm. event, you, you know, for them, it's what they've known. And they're so clear about guns don't make us safe, more guns don't make us safe. Um, and so on, on that issue, whenever I hear my 24 year old daughter speak, when I hear um, Maya speak and any of her colleagues at universities, um, I am so hardened by that because as a mother, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to make it safer and better for my children. And I'm sorry that they're learning this lesson through such terrible headlines and stories, but this will be what they will say, no, no, 
we are we are not interested in being sold this that more makes us safer and they should be everywhere. Um, so that that really um, hardens me, um, gives me hope, and I hope that you'll feel that when you hear Maya next week. I think um, she's just wonderful, and so. Mm -hmm. Take it away, young people. <laughs> yeah, she was a fearless, <laughs> Maya was a fearless testifier at so many committee meetings. And she had um, an injury on her leg. And so she had to get up on crutches and limp to the to the microphone. So she was a real hero. Yeah. Good. You know, you just helped us plug next week. We yeah, are going to be good. talking to Maya Zuckerberg and just like the two of you, she is a champion for common sense gun legislature at every single level. And I just, I appreciate you all so much for the work that you do. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy, busy schedules today. And I hope that you have a joyous and wonderful weekend without stress because the Arizona legislature is not, it's not in session. So we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everybody. Have a great weekend. Enjoy. Stay cool. Stay warm bye -bye. wherever you are. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, Bye Anne. Bye.